All right. So in today's presentation, I'm going to cover just kind of the rationale behind like the whole field of marine robotics, um, the basic principles of operation behind most maritime robots, uh, the applications of various types of fields, I mean, various types of vehicles, and uh, cool use cases in the real world right now today, at least in my opinion. Also, uh, I'll uh, go over some of the cool competitions that are out there. I guess I could click. There we go. So what is the purpose of maritime robotics? Well, first of all, you can do uh, exploration. So you'll find that a, um, organizations like the NOAA um, doing research in the ocean often use um, ASVs and AUVs. So those are autonomous surface vehicles and autonomous underwater vehicles. Um, there's also what we call ROVs, which are remotely operated vehicles. So in the top left uh, picture, that is an ROV. You can see it's tethered to the ship um, in the back right there. To the right of that is a example of a sea glider. We'll get into that a little bit more later, but these are autonomous vehicles that just kind of glide across the ocean. To the right, we have what's called an Argo float. These don't really have propulsion, but um, are one of the biggest uh, forms of data collection in the ocean that I can think of. It's probably one of the biggest marine robotics projects out there. Um, on the bottom is a sail drone, which is also another way of, um, another vessel that does a lot of data collection. Um, we'll also go into this one a little more later. I really think this company is very cool. And on the left is a somewhat typical example of um, what a, a, a autonomous underwater vehicle looks like. Uh, not too different from your typical submarine, just a lot smaller. Uh, there's a lot of different like things you can use them for, though. Um, not just uh, you know gathering like pH data in the oceans, but with ROVs you can actually like do manipulations with uh, sample samples, so you can like do some fine um, fine tuned co uh, sample collection. You can also um, there's also some applications of trying to send green robotics into space one day, say the uh, icy moons of Europa, or icy moon of Europa, uh, where it's thought that there is a deep ocean like far beneath the ice there. So the general principle of operation of, say, a boat or a submarine is buoyancy, which I'm sure you've probably gone over in high school or seen before. So the general principle is that you have a mat, like an object, and if it has less density, it goes up. If it has higher density, it goes down. And the displacement is about um, equivalent to, well, the way you can calculate displacement um, disregarding like surface tension and things like that um, is you take like the mass of the water in the area you're going to that your boat will take up and that's about the amount of mass that you can fit onto your boat without it sinking um, so based on this principle you can either go up and down either by controlling buoyancy or using neutral buoyancy plus thrust. So for as, as far as controlling buoyancy goes, um, like in real submarines that have uh, humans inside, you usually have ballast tanks, um, which alter the density of your vehicle by bringing in more water. Um, but those are those add extra complexity. Uh, so unless you have a particular need to not have active propulsion keeping you down, um, you don't see this too much, especially like in small robots. Um, so the other common method is just having a neutral buoyancy and using a upward downward thruster to um, calculate, I mean, to control your uh, your depth in the water. Oftentimes, you'll see that these uh, default buoyancies are set to just slightly positive. So just in case something goes wrong, your sub will automatic like it'll just physically 
tend to go upwards over time, so it doesn't sink to the bottom. So this is actually how our sub uh, plunger works. Uh, there's Rahul in the right corner there, posing next to the sub. Um, and you can see there in the uh, the bottom of the sub there, we have our up and down thruster. We have we have three thrusters. Um, those two lateral ones at the top uh, control your uh, what is that? Your yaw and the um, up and down that controls your depth. So propulsion. So there's uh, there's two basic forms of propulsion in marine robotics. Um, or maritime vehicles in general, you have props and paddles, and then you have buoyancy. So props and paddles, so a long time ago, you saw steamships with these big paddles, and uh, you don't see those very often anymore. The reason is um, props like the bottom right, um, or screws, those are just more efficient, which is why paddle boats like that don't really exist anymore. And then buoyancy, so on the left here, that is an example of a sea glider. Um, RoboNation actually has a program called Sea Glide for uh, I think K through 12, where you actually build a tiny little uh, sea glider out of a bottle with wings, and this kind of works like an airplane, um, except it's like having an airplane, but you can control its uh, <laughs> control its buoyancy. So you can have it sink, and you can use that those wings to move forward, and then you can. Um, increase your buoyancy again and then it'll continue moving in the same direction but it'll start going upwards and you just do that over and over and over again. So you can experiment th with this yourself using a using a sea glide kit if you really feel inclined to. So I'm forgetting one kind of very important form of propulsion and that is sails. So of course sails are one of the <laughs> original forms of propulsion but you don't see them too often anymore. That's uh, the USS Constitution right there. Um, it's often docked in Boston, Massachusetts. I definitely recommend checking it out. There's a really cool history behind the engineering behind that boat. But a re more recent example of uh, sails in, say, maritime robotics is the sail drone. So this is a startup that's based, I think, in Alameda, California. And the principle of operation is that they have what's called a wing sail. So, in a sense, this is basically just a wing cut in half and then uh, propped on top of a boat. And you use the general same principles of aerodynamics, and um, instead of lift, you're just trying to produce thrust. And it's a little different from a wing, as you can see, but like the concepts like airfoils and stuff, that you have that in common. Interestingly, this actually came out of um, uh, land sailing. So in the bottom right, like those are like land sails, um, where people go out in the desert and race using sails in the desert on uh, wheeled vehicles. I think the founder of Sail Drone was uh, was into that, and that's where they got drew a lot of their inspiration. So yes, it's it's all aerospace engineering at the end of the day. Um, at least when it comes to sails. So here is an example of marine robots without any type of propulsion. Like who needs propulsion anyways? As far as like data collection goes, at the end of the day, what you want is just a huge volume of robots or sensors. So right there, you've got a buoy on the left. Um, those can be anchored. Sometimes buoys aren't anchored, so they just drift and give you your GPS position. And on the right is an example of the, um, the Argo float and its general principle of operation. So the only thing that the Argo float does is it controls its buoyancy. So it'll descend for a while, descend some more, collect data on the whole trip there, and then it'll come back up again and use that antenna on top to transmit to a satellite and send that data back to shore. Um, and this is um, a very specific class of robots. So this is what's called an ROV, or robot, Remotely Operated Vehicle. And this is what you often see for anything that requires like fine-tuned um, sample collection. So these are often carried on research vessels, and they'll have a crane lower them down, and 
they have to be tethered to the boat because you can't actually send any radio signals into the water very far. It's very difficult to use EM to like communicate with vehicles in the ocean. Uh, but these can go to extreme depths and you can see on the front of the ROV there you've got cameras and two little containers. So what they'll do is they'll actually have um, little arms and other mechanics to pick up samples from the bottom of the ocean. And that often involves a human operator because robots um, don't really know what you want as a scientist necessarily. And it can be it can involve a lot of difficult tasks to do that. Though, given that how much AI has changed in the last 20 years, maybe we'll see some more uh, autonomous vehicles doing that in the future. But for now, they, uh, they're usually tethered. Sometimes you have systems with two ROVs, or like you have a system where there's like a daisy chain of tethers, I think. I think I've seen an example of that. On the right is another RoboNation program called Sea Perch. Um, this is also for K through 12, uh, but it's a it's an example of an ROV where it's tethered. But you can uh, you can make a, your own ROV for a very small sum of money if you really want to. Um, so this is where I'm going to go into more specific use cases. So again. For the third time, here's the Argo float uh, with a little more uh, information about what's actually inside. So you've got the computer, you've got the gear motor, piston, and that's basically everything going into like controlling the buoyancy of the Argo float. Um, because that's the, the real only actuator you really need. And on this map, you can see like everywhere that an Argo float is in the world. Um, in 2018, there were 3,881. I think that number has only continued to grow. Um, I'm going to pull up the ECSD website about that here uh, because it's honestly, it's a very, very informative website. Uh, you can see some real cool science they're doing. So one thing that they're doing is just like improving float lifetimes. So in the ocean, you know, like lots of, lots of hard for harsh forces to deal with. Um, communications. This one I thought was really interesting is ice detection, which I think actually honestly in, can relate to what we do as an organization as well, um, because you, they have to s sense what's ab above them, and that's a very big problem. You you really um, I mean even even like navy ships have surfaced into, uh, or navy subs have surfaced into vehicles above them, um, even in recent history. Uh, which is never a good thing, but um, it just shows you like how much of a challenge it is to sense what's above you. So here you can see their diagram they've got here um, where the float figures out that there is ice above them. Um, I won't go too much into that, but you can see that they manufacture a lot of them. It's a very cool uh, international effort there. I can hit present. So next, again, sail drone. So this has been this is kind of a startup, I think. They've really uh, started really doing things a lot more in recent years. Uh, on the right uh, is the re very recently released uh, Surveyor drone. I think it's like a 70 or 80 foot long um, autonomous boat. I think is huge. It's it's almost a, a person boat, except with no room for a person. On the left there is actually uh, an example. To circumnavigate the Antarctic. So one huge issue they had was that they're their wings, their wing sails would encounter like very strong like forces um, down near the Arctic. I believe there's a huge current that kind of surrounds the Arctic at all times, which is, I mean, Antarctic at all times, which separates it um, as far as temperature goes from pretty much the rest of the world. So what they had to do was they basically chopped off the top of the sail and 
Um, as a result, you kind of got a sail that looks a little more like one of those traditional um, ships of the line from way back. Uh, and that apparently solved the whole issue of aerodynamic forces like tearing apart their sails. They also have a pretty cool website right here. If I can open it. So if, if you ever see uh, internships um, regarding these, they're probably pretty cool. Um, I've seen some in the past. They've done some internships in the past. So if you're into this stuff, I definitely recommend applying if you can. So you can see like the um, you, you got a lot of testimonials from like people like the NOA. Uh, um, even NASA um, doing a lot of research regarding the ocean and the uh, Earth's climate. And this is the last example um, of like a specific robot for today. And this is called IceFin. So you can see right there that it's underneath uh, a big device and that's in the Antarctic. Uh, this is actually made by a lab at Georgia Tech and uh, they also have a cool website. I will link these um, later but they're also in the, the bigger notes for the uh, presentation. I won't play the video because I know that Blue Jeans can have some issues with my video feedback, but I recommend like checking it out later because it's some really cool stuff they're doing and it's here at Tech. So um, if you're looking for some research, uh, you might, might want to reach out. But the idea is that they start, they start, you know, in the Ross ice shelf, but one day, one day a Europa probe. Um, see, I think this is a, an often overlooked part of uh, like mar maritime robots is like the potential for space exploration, mainly because we haven't really figured out a way to get under the ice on Europa yet. That's also another engineering problem is I think you have to drill through like miles of ice. But once you do, once you can do that. And finally, here is a list of existing competitions. So as a club right now, we participate mostly in the RoboNation competitions. So RoboBoat, RoboSub, RobotX. So RoboBoat's like a small uh, service vehicle. RobotX is the wan -V, which is right there. Uh, that's that's actually our club's or our group's uh, wan -V. Um And RoboSub, which is what the sub from earlier competes in. Interestingly, the RoboSub is kind of like a buoy in a way. Like you have all the all the weight at the bottom and the buoyancy at the top, so it stays very stable in terms of um, pitch and roll. There's also the uh, SAUVC or Singapore AUV challenge um, that we sent a submission into last year. Um, it's kind of like RoboSub, um, not too different there. The Micro Transat challenge, now that is a um, challenge for the first crossing of the Atlantic in a vehicle. Um, a robotic uh, transit of the Atlantic, and I think a vehicle less than six or eight feet long um, in beam. So we don't compete in that one, but I think it's a very cool competition. It's There's not much glory involved except being able to say that you're the first to cross the Atlantic uh, in a robotic boat. And another offshoot of that is the World Robotic Sailing Championship, which is more like robo boat except instead of being allowed to use like electric propulsion you have to use a sail and sails are arguably probably a harder um control challenge so maybe one day we'll do that but uh we'll we'll stick to robo boat for now probably and uh, robotics that is basically it for this presentation um thanks for thanks for sticking around